Maybe I should try to toss some pizza in the air. I've never done that. Na 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 na. And there's our cold open. Hi, I'm Erin Jean McDowell, and welcome to a new year of Bake It Up a Notch. Today we are going to be talking about one of my absolute favorite things to make and to eat. It's one of my favorite dinners of all time, but it's also one of my favorite breakfasts of all time. It's everything. It's pizza. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about everything you need to make a great pizza in your own oven at home. You don't need a lot of special stuff. You certainly don't need a fancy pizza oven. And we're going to talk about all the different types of pizza because there are so many delicious ways to pizza. We're going to talk about classic pizzas. We're going to talk about deep dish. We're going to talk about pan pizzas. We're even going to talk about gluten-free and yeast-free pizza doughs. And as always, we're going to tell you where things could go wrong and if possible, how to to fix it. If this sounds like something you're interested in, or if you've loved past episodes of Bake It Up a Notch, please do me a favor and hit like and subscribe so you can be made aware of new episodes as they become available each month. One of the best things about pizza for me is that it really doesn't require a lot of fancy equipment to, to make a great pizza. But there are some tools that can help and also some that I think are worth talking about that you might not typically think of when you're thinking of a pizza. One of the advantages of pizza is that it's really quite simple to make. So you can use a stand mixer to mix your dough if you would like and if your recipe requests it, requests it, suggests it, but in addition, you can also just mix the dough by hand. And mixing it by hand is sometimes even easier. There are a lot of no-need pizza dough recipes out there. We're gonna be making one of those today. So after you've got your dough mixed and you'll need some mixing bowls and a spoon of some sort to bring it all together, there's really just a few things that, that you'll need. And the first tool is one of my favorite tools to talk about. Of course, it's not really a tool. It's attached to our body. It's our hands. But I think it's really important to talk about your hands in pizza dough making because we're not using a rolling pin. We're not using kind of lots of different tools. We're really going to rely on our hands and the feel of the dough for getting it just right. Another piece of equipment that is really useful that you don't have to have but can be so, so great is a pizza stone or baking steel. This is a uh, piece of ceramic stone or a piece of steel that goes into the oven and gets really, really hot hot and retains heat. This is especially helpful for pizza because it does a lot of its best work in the early moments of baking, kind of when this oven spring happens. So in those early moments, we want to kind of capitalize on that and maximize it, and the pizza stone or baking steel really helps. If you're using a pizza stone or a baking steel, you can bake right on that surface, and that's one of the things that's really wonderful because it helps get that crust so beautifully crisp but there are also lots of other options for baking your pizza in. I like to use a nine by 13 inch pan for deep dish pizzas, but you can also use other cake pans as well, other baking pans. Here is just a 10 inch cake pan that is great for a pan style pizza. You can use a baking sheet for making pan style pizzas as well, or another one of my favorites to bake in is a cast iron skillet. It does a similar job to the pizza stone and baking steel of getting heat and retaining it so that that bottom crust gets really beautifully crisp. Also, you usually already have one at home, so it's a great alternative to, you know, buying more tools and getting more things. This is another tool that I like to use, a little bit extra, but I love to talk about it. It's a pizza peel, and this is just kind of a flat piece of wood. It can also be made of metal, um, and it's a little bit thinner at the edge to allow you to slide under your pizza while it's baking and kind of move it around. If you don't have a pizza peel, it's just kind of something that you can skip, or you can use kind of the back of a baking sheet. You can put parchment on the back of the baking sheet and just use that to slide your pizza in and out of the oven. I also highly recommend a good uh, pizza cutter or pastry wheel as I refer to them in this kitchen because we're making pastries more often than we're making pizza. But the pastry cutter is really, really, or the pizza wheel. <laughs> 
<laughs> is really, really good pizza cutter um, for cutting your slices. Of course, you can also use a knife, a sharp knife, or a mezzaluna, which is a blade on kind of two handles for cutting the whole pizza. And you also might find it helpful to have a dough or bench scraper handy during the process of making pizza dough, both during the process of shaping it or also dividing it if you're making multiple smaller pizzas. It's also great for cleaning up at the end. I always like to give a nice shout out to my bench scraper. So like I said, there really isn't that much special equipment you need. You can really bake a pizza with whatever you've got in your house. And in this episode, we are gonna try to show you just that. Lots of different kinds of pizzas, so let's get baking. Let's talk about the dough because of course a great pizza starts with a great dough, but there are lots of different kinds of dough. That said, they usually have kind of the same base ingredients and it's more about the ratio in which those ingredients kind of come into play. Typically you're going to be dealing with a base flour. That base flour could be all purpose flour. It might be bread flour, which has a slightly higher protein content, which enables for a little more chew, or it could be a flour like semolina. And semolina flour, um, which I use in some of these recipes, is a really finely ground durum wheat flour. It has a slightly yellow color, but a very, very fine, delicate texture. Great, great for pizza. The actual dough itself is going to have just these base ingredients. It's basically going to be flour, a little bit of salt or other seasoning, yeast, and water. Sometimes additional ingredients are added for flavor, things like olive oil. You might remove some of the water and flour and use a sourdough starter as a base of your dough as well. So the base ingredients and the ratio in which they are uh, combined will change the ultimate texture of the pizza dough. But the dough itself is quite easy and simple to make. Um, you can kind of make it a few different ways, and I'm gonna show you both an easy way and a slightly more complex way to mix your dough. When you're mixing the dough, you're basically looking to get those ingredients evenly and homogeneously combined. So all we're trying to do is get a nice, smooth, even dough. Some recipes are gonna require a longer suggested mix time, and some recipes are gonna require almost no mix time at all. And it just has to do with kind of how that dough is rising, how it's getting to its final place, Place and how you're gonna bake it into its final pizza product. Pizza dough is so, so simple to make, and one of my favorite recipes is not mine, but I have used it from Food52 for many years. It's Jim Leahy's No Need Pizza Dough. It's a genius recipe. It's been on the site for many years, and I love it. It's truly one of my most go-to recipes because it's a no need recipe, meaning we're just gonna dump everything into the bowl, mix it together and let it sit for a long time. Just adding my salt and yeast to the flour. The structure of this particular dough is made from that longer time that it's going to sit. So that is really, really important. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So I'm just gonna add the water because this has a long rest time, you're not necessarily using warm water in a no need recipe like this. You might be using room temperature water and we'll just stir it till it comes together. We're not really trying to knead it. That's why this is called no knead pizza dough. We're really just trying to stir it to evenly hydrate the mixture and then it'll be ready for its long rest. And if your other recipes are going to call for mixing in a stand mixer, they're generally going to use the dough hook attachment rather than the paddle. And you'll usually kind of use that to knead the dough to that desired elasticity, that desired smoothness, and getting all the ingredients combined. I think I'm gonna have to dive in here with my hands for the final part, but I'm not mad at that. I'm not really baking unless I'm doing something with floury hands, I feel. So once this gets combined, we're not gonna mix it any further. We just wanna see no like dry floury pockets. Kind of folding the dough over onto itself to make it happen, just like that. Comes together really, really quickly. That's one of the beauties of a no need pizza dough. So one of the things that's great about this no need dough is it's obviously intended to be made ahead. It actually has an 18 hour rest time before you can even use the dough. We're gonna talk about why that is and why it's so genius and why it works so beautifully a little bit later. But 
after the initial 18 hour rise, it can actually stay in the refrigerator for up to three days. It's an incredibly flexible base dough, very weeknight friendly for making into dinner so quickly and a delicious dinner at that because no one is ever going to be sad that it's pizza night. So this is such a great, easy go-to recipe. And it's just a reminder why pizza is so great because it can start with such a simple combination of ingredients that you just mix in one bowl. Let's talk about slowing down and speeding up your rise times. Something that I think is really misunderstood about things that have yeast in them, any kind of yeast risen doughs, is that you're really in control of the ratio of how much time it's gonna take. And the recipes that you're using have been formulated for specific amounts of time. So for example, the amazing Jim Leahy no need pizza dough. The reason that it takes 18 hours to rise is because there's actually very little yeast in the recipe. Jim Leahy has chosen to maximize on the flavor and the strength that can be built with a long rise time. And that means that he can use less yeast to start out with. On the other hand, if you wanna skip that long, long, long rise time, can you actually increase the amount of yeast? Yes, you can. You can increase the amount of yeast, which will therefore decrease the total amount of rise time and just make the whole process go a lot faster. You do sacrifice a small amount of flavor when you speed up the process because yeast kind of builds more of that incredible, noticeable flavor with the longer rise times. That's why we get such great flavor from things like sourdough and other starters. So it's just something to consider. I have an article all about this on Food52 that you can check out how to speed up and slow down your rise times. And right here in front of us, we have a big old bowl of Mimi's pizza dough. This is a triple batch just to give you a little bit of an indication of how many pizzas we are making today. And we use some of that information to help us make some of this dough ahead for filming Bake It Up a Notch. But it's just as useful in your everyday life trying to figure out how you're gonna make pizza at home in your own kitchen. You're in control if yeast is involved. So also be sure to check out our yeast episode of Bake It Up a Notch, which will give you some more insight into one of my favorite ingredients. Let's talk about the no need pizza dough and all the pizzas that we can make with it. I am gonna demonstrate each of these styles of pizzas and kind of talk about how to build them, how you might wanna top them and any kind of special considerations. So this first pizza that I'm gonna do is really to me the, the classic, the most classic pizza, a very thin crispy crust that sort of bubbles at the outside edge and is just so perfect in every way. So we're using the no need pizza dough that has rested for 18 hours to build this. I'm gonna start by stretching it a little bit by hand and I'm using some semolina flour for the dough. Um, the semolina flour, because of the texture of it, this beautiful coarseness that it has, it's just really great for the shaping and keeping your dough really nice and workable and not sticking. So I'm just gonna apply the semolina as I need and then I'm gonna start using my fingertips to gently stretch the dough. You wanna be pretty gentle with this, um, more of kind of letting gravity do the work rather than trying to actively pull it because if you pull it too hard, um, that's when you might get rip or tear holes in the dough. So once you get it pretty well stretched out, you can go ahead and transfer it to your pizza peel. If you don't have a pizza peel, you can do this on a piece of parchment paper and just do it right on a baking sheet. And that works really, really beautifully. And once we get it on the peel, we can continue to stretch and also stipple it. When the dough is relaxed, it should do this quite easily. If the dough is really resisting these movements, it probably means that it needs more rest time. This is more typical when people are kind of trying to rush the process on a weeknight and you've sped up the process, you've sped up the rise time overall, and as a result, your dough is kind of springy. It's okay for it to be a little thicker around the outside edges. Of course, this is also personal preference. I'm like saying these things Things like I am the pizza queen. I am not the pizza queen. That's the best part about making pizza at home. You are the pizza queen or king or princess or whatever you want to be. Royal or not, you will have delicious pizza 
And best of all, it's going to be exactly how you want it. And then when I'm done, I just like to go under all the way around one more time and just make sure that I can lift it up. If it's stuck at all to the pizza peel, it's gonna be a disaster when you try to put it into the oven later. So if necessary, you can just lift up your dough, sprinkle a little more semolina underneath it. And it's really important to do that and check that before you start adding your toppings because it's a lot easier to move the dough at this stage than it is once we weigh it down with sauce and all these things. So let's talk about toppings for a second because it's an important thing to talk about. Of course, literally anything can go on top of a pizza. Um, I'm sure there are people out there that would disagree with me wholeheartedly on that, but yes, really anything could be a pizza topping. And uh, the versatility is one of the things that makes pizza so wonderful and delicious. The main thing you wanna consider is if your ingredient has any kind of moisture, you might want to take extra precautions to remove and reduce some of that moisture before you bake the pizza. A great example of this are mushrooms. Mushrooms are one of my favorite pizza toppings. I love them, but they contain a lot of moisture. So I usually saute or roast or grill the mushrooms briefly to help release some of that moisture, let it cool down completely, and then it's ready to be a pizza topping. Okay, let's, let's build our pizza. We've got our crust. We've stretched this particular crust out quite thin, but a little bit thicker at the edges for a classic pizza. For a classic pizza, there can be sauce or there may be no sauce. That's sort of up to you. Um, they're gonna do sauce on this one. We're gonna do kind of a couple classic pizzas here. We're gonna do a diavolo, which is basically pepperoni. <laughs> Spicy soppressata on top of sauce with cheese. And we're also going to do, man, my pronunciation if I try to do this in Italian is going to be really bad. So instead I will just say four seasons. They call it the four seasons and you top each section, each quarter of the pizza with a different uh, ingredient that represents the four seasons. So I'm going to uh, put my hot soppressata down for this one next. This is a little bit of another thing that you can kind of choose as you prefer, whether or not you want to put your toppings below the cheese or on top of the cheese. <laughs> this is up to you. The advantage of putting them below the cheese is that they stay on really well. So as you're eating and taking bites, the downside of putting them below is that people can't physically see them. So I'm gonna put the, the hot soppressata under and then we will do the rest of them on top. And then the type of cheese that you're gonna use can vary. On a classic pizza like this, I love to use fresh mozzarella and I typically dice my fresh mozzarella into varying sizes. And dicing it enables it to start the process of melting a little bit quicker in the oven. Fresh mozzarella, of course, is very hard to shred, but you can also do slices. I just think that dicing is a little bit easier to get it all over the pizza and kind of get those like, beautiful cheesy pools of goodness that we love with the pizza. And if you want, you can also use some shredded cheese. We can add some Parmesan to the top of this when we're done. That's the beauty of pizza is that we can do all of those things and more. And we've just made a pizza. I just realized that we can't make the next one until I put this one in the oven <laughs> because I put it on here. So let me see if the oven is preheated. <laughs> It isn't. <laughs> All right, so once our pizza is ready, it's on the peel, you wanna make sure your oven is really, really nice and hot, but then it is time to bake this pizza. Let's bake it. Let's put it in the oven. And you should actually, you should come with me. It wasn't very graceful. <laughs> Cheese happens. Cheese does happen. That's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> First pizza, ready to rock. So how far you take the doneness is also kind of up to you. Sometimes I let the cheese brown a little bit more and sometimes I like the cheese to be gooier and more pulley. So completely up to you. 
So more delicate toppings like fresh herbs or things you might want to add at the end, like a drizzle of olive oil or some crushed red pepper flakes, anything like that can go on right when it comes out of the oven. <laughs> Pretty things are happening from overhead. I'm sorry, I'm truly delighted. I didn't think it was gonna be possible to like any episodes more than the pie episodes, but I guess it's pizza pie, so that counts. What? It's still going? <laughs> so good. Sometimes prosciutto or other ingredients are added towards the end and they just kind of rest on the top. Oh, isn't she a beaut? We'll let her cool for a second. Listen to that. Yes. Oh, the crunch. Oh God, this is just the best day of my entire life. So there is our Four Seasons pizza. And I'm leaving with this piece. You cannot have it. The next pizza I wanna talk about is deep dish pizza. And I have a lot of people in my life who have differing opinions about deep dish pizza. I tried deep dish pizza for the first time in Chicago. The style that I do is not a true Chicago style, which of course is even deeper and even like juicier and cheesier and saucier. But for me, one of the things that's really great about a deep dish pizza is with more dough comes more Topping ability. <laughs> Did I just Spider-Man that? I didn't mean to. But when you have more dough as a base, you have a little bit more heft for putting things on top. And for me, there's something really enjoyable about like sinking my teeth into that really doughy, spongy, like chewy texture of a deep dish pizza dough. So a couple of things you need to know about deep dish pizza. For one thing, when it comes to the dough, there's obviously more of it. We're not stretching it as thin. It's more about stippling it like focaccia. So here I have one recipe of deep dish pizza dough in a nine by 13 pan. I used olive oil in the bottom of the pan and I'm just gonna use my fingers to stipple this out to the edges a little bit. And it's probably not gonna be perfect, so we'll give it f a few minutes and come back and do it again. And you don't, of course, have to only bake deep dish in a nine by 13. I also really love doing it as a skillet. So I also have some dough that I already started stretching. And you can see this is the second stretch for this dough and how much easier it is to get it to the edge the second time. So we're dealing with a much thicker base of dough. That also means that we need to bake at a much lower temperature. Classic pizza is typically baked as hot as you can get your oven. 500 degrees is beautiful. Deep dish pizza, it bakes more like 375. Some recipes might even go down to 350, um, depending on what you're dealing with. And it has to do with having more dough that we've got to get baked. Things are baking from the outside in. We want to make sure we give it enough time to bake through sufficiently and get that ideal texture. Deep dish for me is not really deep dish without a good amount of sauce and like a pretty plentiful amount, more than you might put on a typical pizza. Like with the classic pizza, I kind of spread it very thin. With this, I like to really pile on a decent amount because that's part of the beauty of the deep dish is all the sauce. I'm gonna do the skillet pizza as a supreme pizza. So I'm gonna lay some cheese down and also a bunch of toppings. Sausage, pepperoni, mushrooms, onions, peppers. Okay, so that's gonna be our skillet pizza. Supreme and beautiful. And the time that it took me to assemble that skillet pizza is probably all I need for this bad boy. This is something that I want to show too. See how there's oil pooling at the edges? I didn't actually put that much oil in this pan, but what has happened is as the dough has filled the pan, 
the like force of the dough has almost pushed that oil to the outside edge. And it's not bad. It's what's going to help make that outside edge brown a little bit more. So I'm just going to push in such a way that some of that oil almost comes up over. Beautiful. So we've got our, this dough already and we can go ahead and pile the toppings and the sauce on to this baby. I'm gonna do cheese on top of sauce for this classic deep dish pizza, but again, anything goes. Okay, so here is our cheese, our mozzarella deep dish pizza pie. It's in our baking dish. Like I said, these are gonna take longer to bake and at a lower temperature. We're gonna bake them at 375 till the dough is really golden and the cheese is all melted and gooey. It's going to be amazing. We'll put these into the oven and come back for them in a bit. I can't lift both of these at the same time. Who am I kidding? <laughs> our deep dish pizza, our first dip deep dish pizza has come out of the oven. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a cut. You know, normally on Bake It Up a Notch, we don't even slice into anything until the very end of the episode, but we're not gonna let this pizza have its like best moment not in our bellies. So we're doing things a little different for this episode just so that we can show you the pizza at its best and also enjoy it over here. And if you see us enjoying it as much as we're going to, you're gonna be like, I have to make pizza now. Just like the first slice of pie, the first slice of pizza can be kind of tricky. So I took a sacrifice slice. Yes. <laughs> and that is a cheese pull. So we've got our incredibly soft, pillowy, deep dish pizza dough. And there's just a lot more of it, which is part of what makes it softer and pillowy, but it was also baked at a lower temperature. And that's what gives us this kind of soft dough that isn't overly crisp. And kind of the crisp bits have come from where the cheese and the sauce have mingled beautifully on the top of our pizza pie. Mmm, deep dish. I love you, deep dish pizza. You still have a place in my heart. Now go away. I truly love all kinds of pizza, but this next style of pizza is the one that I grew up eating, the one I kind of get specific cravings for when I'm thinking about pizza. It's pan style pizza. This is the kind of pizza that my mom would make for me and my brothers and now she makes for her uh, four grandkids. And it's super easy, super friendly, the least special equipment requiring because you just make it on whatever size baking sheet you have. You can adjust it to be a more personal size pan pizza you, or you can make a really big one. My mom would usually make like three or four or five or six of these for my brothers and I, depending on how many of my brothers were coming over, she needs more pizzas because we're, we're a big appetite family in that regard. So now I lovingly call it Mimi's Pizza because my nieces and nephews or nibblings, if you're looking for a gender neutral term for niece and nephew, I just learned this, it's nibbling, amazing, a great word. My nibblings call my mom and dad Mimi and Papa. And so the grandkids call this style of pizza, Mimi's Pizza. And so I am putting up this recipe on Food52, linked down below in this video. It is of course a pan style pizza, but I like to think of it as Mimi's Pizza. So we're making a Mimi's Pizza right now. I started with an oiled baking sheet and I'm stippling the dough out to spread it and I'm flipping it even. I don't know if my mom does that or not. That's just something that I do to help coat the whole piece of dough in oil. I find that you get a really lovely result with this pizza if you have this like very oily exterior so that it gets really, really crisp. So that's I think good for this first one. We'll let it take a minute and we'll oil up another tray. So we've got two pizzas here, two pan style pizzas. We've got the Mimi and we've got the Papa. 
the Mimi pizza. I asked my mom what her favorite pizza toppings were, and she immediately responded saying, oh, well, no one likes what I like on my pizza. And I was like, even better. We're doing a lot of pizzas in this episode. I want to know what toppings you want to put on this pizza. And she said that it breaks one of my dad's rules in the kitchen, which my dad does not like starch on starch. So my mom likes this particular pizza, which is sliced potatoes, Castelvetrano olives, mozzarella, feta cheese, and garlic olive oil. It's a sauceless pizza and it's starch on starch and we're making it happen for Mama McDowell, the Mimi. We're gonna work this dough till it's about a half an inch thick and you can make it thinner or thicker, kind of depending on what kind of pizza you like, but this is meant to be a slightly thicker pizza. It's not meant to be super thin and crisp, it's meant to have a little bit of chew. So we'll stretch this out, leave it for a few minutes, we'll come back to our other one and give it another stretch. So this particular pizza dough is made with bread flour, which has a slightly higher protein content than all purpose. So that makes it a little bit of a stronger dough, a little bit tougher. The other thing that contributes to its strength is semolina flour. It's not a huge amount of semolina flour, but it gives a, a beautiful texture to this final dough as well. And also lends a good amount of strength. The result is a dough that is more difficult to stretch out because it requires a little bit of time. So unlike some of the other ones, our, our 18 hour no need pizza dough that right out of the bowl shaped beautifully and was very flexible, this one is gonna need a little bit of a break. And one of the things that my mom always did with it was just leave it on the stove top on the burners while the oven is heating up. That way it's kind of got some heat circulating around it, five or so minutes, 15 max, waiting like that, it'll be ready to stipple out again. And the idea is you don't need to fill the entire baking sheet, but we want it to be a relatively rectangular, even shape. And it becomes easier to do that as it sits and relaxes a little bit. So we're gonna do an initial stipple, let it rest for a few moments, come back, stipple it again, and we'll be ready to top our pan pizzas. I let these rest for just a moment. I'm just gonna push it out a little bit more. And I actually made both of these pan pizzas a little bit different. This one is a little thinner and the other one is a little thicker. And that way we can even just kind of see in the final product um, the difference for those of you at home who are wondering, which one do I wanna make? Do I want a thinner one or a thicker one? And as you can see the second time, it stretched out a lot easier just cause it had had some time to relax. So we'll give a few dollops of sauce for this first one. This first one I'm gonna make is the Papa, the dad-inspired pizza. Thin layer of sauce with a pan pizza. You can be a little heftier than you might with a classic pizza because there is a little bit more dough, but you still don't want it to get soggy or be too wet. So you wanna keep it a relatively thin all over coating. My mom usually uses on her pan pizza, she usually uses shredded cheese. So I'm going to use some, but as I mentioned before, I like to do on pretty much all of my pizzas, I like to do some diced cubes of fresh mozzarella. Um, I just find that it gives these beautiful, like gooey, cheesy pockets. Cheesy pockets. Words that sound good together in context, but wouldn't, outside of it. Like you wouldn't want cheesy pockets, like pockets full of cheese. No, I might actually want pockets full of cheese. <laughs> that would be so bad. Okay, a little bit of cheese. And by a little bit of cheese, I mean, I just put six handfuls of cheese on this pizza. Now I'm gonna do some onion. In the McDowell family, we put onions on almost every pizza, but I have refrained so far today, just in case there are some of you who are wondering why. Why so much onion? Okay, mushrooms. Mama McDowell approved texture mushrooms. Okay, so this is the Mimi, my mom's preferred, and we're gonna give it a little drizzle of garlic oil. I'll rub that in. 
There's no sauce on this pizza, so we're a little bit more plentiful with the oil. And then we're gonna layer some sliced potatoes. My mom told me that she usually cooks the potatoes first, so that's what I did. I boiled whole potatoes and then thinly sliced them, skins and all, because I quite love potato skins, but peel them if you like. Mimi won't mind. <laughs> Next thing you know, mom's in the YouTube comments, like, I mind very much. <laughs> then we're gonna do some halved Castelvetrano olives. My mom always says these olives taste like butter. <laughs> They're just so like somewhere between meaty and buttery. Let's do another drizzle of oil for those potatoes. Then a crumbling of feta, and we're also gonna do fresh mozzarella. So the main takeaways with pan pizza, really flexible and friendly, even more so than other pizzas. Clearly my favorite, even though I claim to not have a favorite, and they're just so good. They're so delicious. The dough is really versatile. You can make some thinner, some thicker. I mean, it's just, it's just got it all. It really does. The Mimi. Okay, so we're gonna bake both of these pan pizzas. We're gonna bake them at 400 degrees Fahrenheit until they are visibly crisp. I know that when I'm checking these pizzas, I sometimes stick a spatula under the bottom and actually just see how brown they are in the bottom because as they get closer to being done, they're quite sturdy in that way. So we will bake them and 400 degrees until golden and crisp and just how we like them. Mimi pizza. Our first pan pizza, the papa, just came out of the oven and I'm gonna cut it the way that my mom cuts it, though of course anything goes. She usually cuts it in half lengthwise. I love the corner pieces because I want dough on both sides, but I think other people prefer to not have that. So just a good family situation to be in, I guess. But making these has actually given me more like feelings than I thought it was going to because I'm really homesick. I miss my family and I haven't been there in a long time. But that's what's really cool about food is that we can make things that remind us of our family or that our family makes and we can kind of like be transported there. Just another really good excuse to make pizza. Pizza. <laughs> Couldn't help it. One time, one time. Also, it was truly too hot to touch. <laughs> Let's just, I'll take a bite of it in a minute. <laughs> Let's yeah. cut the other one. <laughs> the Mimi. I'm gonna take a corner piece. This is exactly what happens at home. I can't wait to eat it. And the first slice always burns my mouth and I don't even care. Mm. My mom's pizza dough is really crisp on the base, but quite soft in the center. So it like really stands up to a lot of toppings. And I really like this selection that she picked. The Mimi was delicious, but like this is, this is where the memories are. <laughs> Not to pat myself on the back again, but I think I nailed the mushroom texture. It really does taste just like hers. Well, it's missing the one special ingredient that I cannot put in, which is a mother's love. But I put in some air and love to this and it tastes pretty good too. You wanna keep filming me? Cause I'm gonna eat the whole. I'm just greasing up my pan, my nine by 13 pan for our next beauty, the Detroit style pizza. Now the Detroit style pizza is famous for kind of doing things in a different order and having these incredibly crisp edges. Those crisp edges are famously coming from kind of this traditional pan that Detroit style pizza is made in. But if you don't have that pan, as you can see that I do not, you can really use any kind. I actually quite like a ceramic or even cast iron baking dish for doing a Detroit style pizza. But 
the main idea is to get these really, really incredibly crisp edges. I've oiled it really, really well, and I'm gonna add my dough into the base. I'm gonna do a little bit of stretching to the dough before I add it, just to start helping it fit in this pan. And then I'll do the rest of the work with some stippling. Detroit style pizza is not the same as deep dish pizza for a few different reasons. For one, there actually isn't a ton of dough. It's not as doughy and chewy as what a true deep dish pizza is. Instead, it's a thinner layer of dough, but it does have a similar kind of spongy texture on the inside. On the outside, it gets incredibly crisp, like these incredibly browned edges. And that is really what the Detroit style pizza is all about. Also though, it's the arrangement of the toppings. I sometimes still put just a tiny bit of sauce in the bottom. We're gonna put most of the sauce on top for a Detroit style pizza, but I only do this because it truly does help some of the other ingredients stick to the dough a little bit better. I'm gonna do pizza and cheese, or pizza, pepperoni. <laughs> I'm just gonna layer this pizza with some pizza. We're gonna do pepperoni and cheese and that's another thing that's typically different about Detroit style pizza. It uses a style of cheese that is sometimes called brick cheese. If you can't get the specific brick cheese, a low moisture brick style mozzarella is ideal, keeping the moisture down because we're gonna use a lot of cheese in this recipe. So you don't wanna use something like fresh mozzarella. It'll really be too wet and you won't be able to get the same kind of consistency. So we'll do cheese next. We've got that diced brick cheese and you kind of want to put it all over. One of the things that happens in a good slice of Detroit style pizza is some of the cheese is at the edge and it has really browned beautifully. So it's even great to have some of that cheese at the edge. And you can still use a blend of cheeses. You can use some shredded as well. I like to use some Parmesan on a Detroit style since it also will help with the browning of those golden edges. So we're baking a Detroit style pizza at a higher temperature. The other really different thing about it is it's baked at 500 degrees. It's baked a little bit more like a classic thinner crust pizza, but it comes out like a very different style of pan pizza. So just really, really beautiful. But remember, Detroit is not deep dish. It's its own thing. Cause now the sauce goes on top, baby. And a decent amount of it at that. And it's, it's a relatively wet sauce. Sometimes with pizza sauce, you've cooked some of the moisture out of it. But the idea is by putting the cheese under this like sauce blanket, it becomes super molten on the inside, but then browns and becomes incredibly crisp on the outside, on the edges. So really a Detroit style pizza is all about the edges. <laughs> That's like our favorite part. And we're gonna make sure the sauce is all over the surface of the pizza. I might do a little more Parmesan just to be extra because more cheese. This is going to bake in a 550 degree oven until we get those incredibly crisp edges and the cheese is gonna be melty on the inside. Sometimes with Detroit style pizza, I actually take an internal temp to really make sure that it's molten and gooey. You can almost do a toothpick test like you would do for cake, but just to see if the cheese is melty enough inside. All right. Our Detroit style pizza is out. I am cutting it. it. I was just thinking to myself that this particular pizza is so much more about the taste than it is the way it looks because it kind of looks as one of our lovely camera gentle dudes pointed out, like lasagna. Like I just kind of looks like I have a tray of lasagna here but it is in fact pizza. There is dough under there somewhere. I can't find it yet, but I'm gonna. Yes, whole piece of pepperoni. <laughs> See, you don't find that in your lasagna. Am I right? 
I'm getting so many like pizza facials today too from all the steam. I'm gonna have like a beautiful radiant skin because of pizza. <laughs> okay, so this is glorious. The other thing that you can see when you look really closely at this particular Detroit style pizza, which I'm going to wait for a moment to eat because it is truly so molten, you're looking for this visible, like almost blackness at the edges. Okay, of course I put it back in the pan and now I wanna show you that blackness. Come here, come here. See what I'm talking about there? And some of that is the dough getting really brown, but some of that is the cheese getting like super dark on the edge. And that that is literally the color that you want. You wanna see some slightly black. You don't want the whole pizza to be burned, but you want a little bit of blackness because it does show that you've gotten to that ideal texture of crispy on the edges and soft in the center. So that is our Detroit style pizza. Nice, medium thick layer of dough at the bottom, a little bit spongy, but gets beautifully crisp at the edge. Then we layered our ingredients, our toppings and cheese first, then a nice layer of sauce, which makes everything so molten on the inside and brings us this particular form of pizza perfection. So because I'm a firm believer that pizza is for everyone, I wanted to cover two other less commonly discussed types of pizza dough. The first one being a gluten-free pizza dough. And it's actually very easy to substitute a gluten-free all-purpose flour into a pretty standard pizza dough ratio. The only difference is that, of course, gluten-free flours hydrate very, very differently. And the result is going to be not the same kind of strong dough. So it's not quite as flexible to make this dough far ahead. It's not quite as friendly at every stage, but it doesn't require a super long rise time. So you can mix it up, give it a little bit of a rise, just about an hour, and then it is ready to use. The other main difference that you're gonna see is in the way that I handle it. I'm gonna bake it on a parchment lined baking sheet, or you can even slide the parchment onto a baking peel and slide it right onto a stone if you'd like. I just usually opt for the baking sheet, keep it a little bit easier. And the dough is not super easy to handle. So in addition to having the dough next to me here, I have a small bowl of water because I'm gonna keep moistening my hands to use slightly dampened hands to help me spread out the dough. So I'll just grab the dough here. I'll just keep moistening our hands and we're just gonna press it into a circle shape. You can also use oiled hands instead of water. I just find that the water is a little bit easier and less messy so that you don't get oil kind of all over everything that you're working with. And even if the dough feels pretty adhered to the parchment paper, don't worry about that. When this gluten-free dough bakes, the high temperature, it will kind of release itself and it'll be really easy. But that's one of the reasons why I like to do it on parchment rather than trying to shape it free form. I find that this gets me the closest as possible results to a typical pizza, but using a gluten-free dough. This is still a yeast raised pizza dough, so it will have a little bit of that flavor, but the texture is a bit different. It's, it's a little bit crisper, less spongy and light and airy but just as delicious. It's like a nice crispy type of pizza. And I'm actually gonna bake this dough separately without any toppings. So what we're gonna do to finish it is just finish it with a little bit of oil because we're actually going to make this a salad pizza. Once we get it into the shape that we want, we want somewhere between a quarter and a half an inch thick. Some variance in thickness is fine, just like a classic pizza dough, but we wanna keep it in about approximately a round shape and we're going to give it a drizzle of olive oil on the surface. We're gonna bake this in a 425 degree oven until it is very, very crisp. Another thing that's a little bit different about gluten-free doughs, they don't always brown quite the same way as a typical wheat-based flour will. So just something to keep an eye out for. Don't worry if your dough is a little bit more blonde. There's nothing wrong with it. It will be just as delicious. If you wanna give it a little bit of help browning, you can even sprinkle a little bit of Parmesan cheese over the surface before baking as it will brown really nice and beautifully over your dough as it bakes. We're gonna bake it till it's nice and crisp. Then we will add our salad topping.
when I was in college, there was an amazing pizza place not far from campus where we all went to get pizza and they were quite famous for this salad pizza that they had, which was just some baked dough with a really creamy kind of blend of chopped salad on the top. I wanted to echo that with this particular pizza. And I especially love a green pizza or a salad pizza like this in the summer uh, when I'm doing pizza dough on the grill. I'm just gonna, I made kind of this creamy salad and it's kind of everything I love about like an Italian chopped house salad. So it's a couple of different kinds of greens. It has some pickled peppers like pepperoncini or pepadu peppers, whatever you prefer. It has some chopped up provolone cheese and then it has this kind of creamy herby dressing. And there's a lot of it because we're just gonna pile it on top here. I like to do a salad pizza like this. Also, it's great for individual pizzas because then everyone can kind of just eat it with a knife and fork. I also just like to make a salad like this because if you're having a little pizza night or a pizza party, you can make a salad pizza like this and then save the rest of the salad to just serve alongside your other salad. Sometimes I like a little bit of a really vinegary salad on top of a richer pizza like the Diavola or one of those other ones we already made. That's looking pretty lovely if I do say so myself. So let's give it a cut. And you can kind of let it cool for a minute before you put the salad on. It shouldn't be piping hot or all your greens are gonna wilt. But the idea is you want them to wilt a little bit. So you don't want it to be totally cool either because you want the to wilt just enough that it kind of stays on top of your pizza. No cheese pull for this one, just a messy bite. <laughs> the gluten-free dough, the flavor is so much like the other classic pizza doughs that we've made. The real difference is in the texture. So for those of you at home who are looking at this, if you want that really, really crisp texture, press your dough a little bit thinner. If you like a thicker, more pan style pizza, leave it a little bit thicker and you'll have a little bit more of that softness and that chew. But any way you slice it, it's going to be a very delicious gluten-free pizza. It really is good. I love yeast very much, but there is still a time and a place for a yeast-free pizza dough. As we head into a new year, one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about was the period of time this year when my extra stores of yeast were very valuable and I was sending them in the mail to people who could not find yeast in the store. And whether you don't have yeast, whether we go through another unexpected yeast shortage, or whether you just are looking for something very quick and easy with no rise time required, this is a really easy dough made the exact same kind of way. You know, all of these doughs are really made through a method that's called the straight dough method, aka dump everything into a bowl and mix it until it's combined. This particular dough will yield something a little bit more akin to a cracker, but it will have a little bit of spring and chew. So it, don't think of it as solely being a crisp cracker, like it does have pizza-like properties, but there's no yeast in it. Instead, there's just a little bit of chemical leavener. Um, by chemical leavener, I mean baking powder. So I'm gonna start patting it out. My surface has a little bit of um, semolina flour on it and I'm just patting it out as thin as I can get it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and transfer it to a parchment lined baking sheet. I'm gonna keep pressing it out once I get it on the baking sheet and being a little bit more firm with it. Because of the way this dough is prepared, it does not have a lot of the strength and structure that a yeasted dough will have. And so it's important that we don't try to stretch it. It's just going to fall apart, break apart in our hands. So we can stretch it on a surface, but we can't do the typical stretching it, tossing it in the air, that sort of moment with our pizza. So once it gets stretched to a nice thickness and we want it relatively thin, we'll give it a drizzle of oil. I'm just gonna use my hands to spread that beautiful oil across the surface. I'm going to make this as a white pizza. So I'm a classic white pizza, which is typically a little bit of ricotta spread over the base instead of sauce. On top of the ricotta, you could add some pepper flakes if you like. I smashed some roasted garlic into this ricotta. And then we're just gonna toss it with an assortment of cheeses, 
some shredded mozz, some fresh mozz, and some Parmesan. This is going to bake at a relatively high temperature, between 450 to 500 degrees. The reason is because we want that advantage of that really high heat to help with this kind of oven spring from our chemical leavener, from our baking powder, to make sure that we get the best possible kind of puff and lightness, fluffiness to our final dough. It's also going to mean that this is going to bake relatively quickly, so keep an eye. The higher the temp, the quicker your pizza is going to bake. Our yeast-free pizza has come out of the oven and it actually had a little bit of a pizza accident, but it's a very delicious one. So this is one of those ones. I didn't even wanna put this in mistakes happen because if this one happens, it's just like lucky whoever gets that slice. But it was like a little weighted unevenly and there was more cheese on this side than on this side. And so some of it has spilled off the crust a little bit and created a little cheese crisp on the edge of the crust. There's really nothing wrong with it. It's kind of amazing. But wanted to point it out since it is there and it's a little different than some of our other pizzas today. Give it a cut. And you see we've got a really, really nice like spongy, but with a nice crispness on the outside edge. We've got a nice little cheese pull babe there. Oh, very hot. <laughs> but it's so, so, so good. It's a really soft texture with just the right amount of crunch. This is a great way to go from zero to pizza in as little time as possible. The one thing that it sort of is lacking that I love about pizza is the flavor of the yeast. But if you're ever in a real hurry, or if we find ourselves in another yeast shortage, this is the recipe for you. Hey. One of the things I love about pizza is that it's really so foolproof. Even when you make a mistake, they usually are relatively delicious. If you cook it a little too long, it's just extra crisp and cheesy. If you underbake it a little bit, it's extra gooey and delicious. So. That said, there are certain things that are so easily preventable and we're gonna talk about them really quick. So one of the first ones is easiest to show with a hot pizza. So even though I have this beautiful dough in front of me, I'm gonna work with this one right here to my right first. This is um, a pizza that we put way too much sauce and toppings on. Um, basically what I was trying to show is that if you overload it with too much wet ingredients, no amount of sufficient baking is going to get it crisp enough and it's going to be very soggy, especially towards the center where you get that kind of, the outside looks crisp, but the, cent the center kind of sags. So let me just cut this. You see at first glance, we still have a relatively crisp base to our pizza, but when we go to pull it apart, this pizza is just like quite soggy. Oh. <laughs> It's very soggy, um, it's soggy, I, I'll just say it. No, you can see though at the back of this pizza, it's not as browned and it's baked at the same temperature and for the same amount of time as the other classic pizzas we baked earlier, but it's just never going to get as dark because it's literally sodden. It has moisture soaking into that crust from too much sauce. So make sure that the amount of sauce and the amount of toppings you're using are varying depending on how thin your dough is. For a classic pizza like this, where the dough is nice and thin, you really wanna keep that layer of sauce really thin and you wanna keep your toppings more sparse. Otherwise, you're gonna have a pizza that tastes delicious, it's loaded with toppings, but you're never gonna get that texture that you exactly want. So our other, uh, well, let's talk about the other baked pizza since it's sitting right here. We already talked about one after baking, so we'll talk about this one. This is a classic pizza dough that was baked at a really low temperature. And basically what you can see is you can see that it's really, really blonde. It actually is remarkably similar in color to the dough itself. It's barely browned, which is kind of amazing. Um, and part of that is that we didn't bake it at a high enough temperature, so the structure still set. The dough had its oven spring where the yeast kind of perked up and then the outside structure of the dough set. It's going to have chew, but it's not gonna have any crunch because we didn't bake it at a high temperature. We baked this pizza at 350, so with enough baking time, it still baked and became an edible pizza, but I sort of make it akin to like 
the pizza that they had in my cafeteria in high school. It's pizza, it's crust and sauce and cheese, but it, it's not very good and it, the texture is just a little off. It doesn't have those things we love about really good fresh pizza. So make sure that you're baking at the right temperature for your pizza to get that browning and to get the texture exactly as you want it. The next one is pretty simple and, and quite easy, and I know most people have experienced this in some form or another, but um, since a lot of pizza doughs say that you can refrigerate them and make them ahead, I wanted to point out that if you don't allow the dough to warm up a little bit, if it's just cold from the fridge, it's never going to be as stippleable stippleable, stretchable? <laughs> You're never gonna be able to stretch it as easily as if you have let it come to room temperature for a few minutes before you begin. So as you can see, I got this dough out to about this amount, but any other amount that I'm trying to do, I press it out and it just goes Part of that is because the dough is physically cold. It's cold in temperature. The other reason that this can happen is just because the dough needs to relax. So if this happens at some point when you add the dough to the tray, we even earlier experienced this happening where I stretched the dough and then it just needed a few more minutes before it could fully and evenly fill the pan. So it can also happen in that regard, but one of the most common times I see this happening for people at home is they just don't allow enough time for their dough to come to room temperature. So bring your dough out from the fridge, you know, 30 minutes-ish before you wanna use it, and then you can start this first stretch. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how hard you try, it is just gonna come back in on you. But if you give it some time at room temperature, it's going to be easy and stretchable every time. I hope you loved this episode of Bake It Up A Notch where we were talking all things pizza. I actually am really surprised that this episode made me feel a lot of things. It made me feel empowered. It made me feel excited. I might have made some moaning noises from things being so delicious. I felt a lot of things, but one of the biggest things that I felt was actually homesickness. I felt so homesick making some of these pizzas that I grew up eating. But I just love that. I love the power of food to bring us these memories and bring us together. If you're stuck at home this winter, making pizza with your family, with whoever is in your bubble, is a great way to just have a great start to the year. So I hope you have got a lot of ideas for making your own pizzas. Be sure to show me the pizzas that you're making with hashtag bake it up a notch. And what was the other thing? <laughs> Happy baking.